What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content that I'm uploading onto my channel, then feel free to subscribe, and you can also offer suggestions on topics and characters and storylines and whatnot that we can have discussions on uh, later on in this channel. So, when I originally made this video of Amazing Spider-Man Volume 1 for All New All Different Marvel, originally it was just this, but then I was like, man, I bet I can add something to this. Like, I bet I can add, like, a little bit of a tack on, a little bit of an add on. And so, we're going to, we're going to do like a two-in-one. Way back in the day, Marvel used to do two-in-ones, where it was literally two stories in one comic. We're going to do this with this video, but we're going to talk about the story where Peter Parker, Spider-Man, punched the Incredible Hulk into orbit. So... <laughs> <laughs> it's beast. Okay, so this this requires a little bit of, of exposition leading up to this. So prior to this story was an event called Acts of Vengeance. And Acts of Vengeance was literally Loki going to some of the most prominent supervillains in the Marvel Universe and saying, hey guys, let's take over the world. And they ultimately failed. They were, you know, all effectively defeated, but it allowed for a really, really cool line-wide crossover event. It took place between 1989 and 1990, I think. And it covered everything. The Avengers, the X-Men, X-Factor, X-Force, Amazing Spider-Man, Namor, with a Submariner, I mean the whole nine yards, it was it was everything. And Marvel did that from time to time. They did it for the purpose of just bolstering titles that wouldn't normally get attention. But it worked, you know, Acts of Vengeance is considered to be one of the coolest crossovers that Marvel had done uh, up until that point, alongside, you know, several others that, that took place here and there. But with regards to Spider-Man, he actually received what's called the Unipower or the, you know, uh, the Enigma Force. He basically became Captain Universe. So here's how that works. The Enigma Force is exactly what it sounds like, an Enigma Force. Marvel just never took the time to explain it. All they did was say, well, this energy source in, uh, emanates from the microverse, which is like this micro universe. It's almost what Ant-Man fell into when he was starting to shrink down in the Ant-Man movie. He was basically shrinking down to the point where he would have discovered the microverse. So it's, it's essentially like this infinite source of energy. The difference here is that Captain Universe is an entity. It's not really a being. Instead, it's like this power source that bonds itself to an individual for the purpose of preserving the universe in times of dire conflict or something like that. Most recently, it bonded itself to a woman when the multiverse was collapsing, but the Captain, you know, Captain Universe couldn't do anything. But when Peter Parker has the Enigma Force or the Unipower, uh, he's basically, he's, he has, he has what's equivalent to the power cosmic. He can do pretty much anything. He can warp reality. He can, you know, manipulate matter, all kinds of cool stuff. It's crazy. But this also brings into the equation a guy, or I guess a version of the Hulk called Joe Fixit. And this in truth is actually my favorite version of the Incredible Hulk. I love this version of the Hulk. Joe Fixit is so cool because it comes with a really cool caveat. So when the Incredible Hulk first popped up, he was gray. Now we know, by virtue of, you know, legends and myths and so on, that uh, he was effectively made green just because of the fact that they couldn't keep the gray scheme going for any real measure of time. It was just too difficult to do. So making him green became the prominent Incredible Hulk, and the six issues where he first appeared or whatever it was, uh, that character was transformed into Joe Fixit. Now, Joe Fixit is basically like the Incredible Hulk in terms of strength. He's not as strong, but he somewhat has the mind of Bruce Banner. He's not a scientist, but he is cognizant of his surroundings, and he's intelligent in so far that he's basically a mob boss, and it's bad badass. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, in, uh, in next week's video on The Incredible Hulk with uh, Red Hulk Volume 2, we'll be covering the return of Joe Fixit. But what the story does is it comes in the aftermath of Acts of Vengeance, where Magneto has basically sworn a vendetta against Peter Parker, also because of the fact that Peter Parker had defeated Magneto while he was in possession of the uh, of the Enigma Force of the Unipower. We're just going to call it like the Unipower, just to make it simple so we don't have to jump back and forth. But what this story does is it initially picks up with Sebastian Shaw of the Hellfire Club. Now, Sebastian Shaw is actually a really cool character here. The reason why is because Sebastian Shaw is not like he was in X-Men First Class. The powers he displayed there were actually the powers of Bishop. The powers of Sebastian Shaw allow him to absorb any form of energy as long as it doesn't destroy his physical body and then turn that energy into physical strength. So if you were to just continual, you know, continually blast him with energy beams that didn't disintegrate his body, he would just continually absorb it to the point where he was just astronomically strong. But he was the head of the Hellfire Club. The problem with this was that Magneto had effectively toppled him and taken his place. And so because of this, Sebastian Sebastian Shaw is looking to regain lost ground, looking to get back into the Hellfire Club by forcing his way in, but he's also been contracted by Magneto to defeat Spider-Man. And so what he does is he says, well, hey, I can knock out two birds with one stone. I can defeat Spider-Man. I can use Grey Hulk to basically try to defeat Magneto, and then we can just walk away and, and call it a day, and I'll be the one running uh, the Hellfire Club again. So, you know, in the middle of one of his rampages, what Sebastian Shaw does is he goes to Grey Hulk, and he says, hey, man, would you be willing to uh, engage in a business proposition with me? Because again, Grey Hulk exists to make money. That's all he cares about. <laughs> he just cares about making money for himself. 
Now we don't initially find out what the business proposition is. Instead, we basically pick up with Peter Parker. Now, Spider-Man having the unipower is brand new to him because again, this basically grants him cosmic level awareness. Now, for those of you guys who don't know, whenever a character has cosmic awareness, it basically means they know everything that's going on in the universe at that particular point in time, but there are ways to control it. In the instance of Peter Parker, his power has kind of run amok from time to time. For example, he accidentally killed a character named Goliath, but for the sake of this particular story, what David Michelini is doing is he's basically saying Peter Parker is keeping his cosmic awareness confined to the Earth, meaning he knows everything that's going on on Earth at this particular point in time. The kicker to this is he only ever really focuses on New York, really just kind of the, the main Manhattan, uh, Queens area, because that's just where he operates out of. Now, what he does is he initially pursues several criminals who are in the midst of committing a robbery, but then after this is finished, he basically takes off and says, okay, you know, cool, the cops can take care of the rest. I basically, you know, dealt with these, these small time guys. And he essentially takes off to spend time with Mary Jane Watson, because again, this is back during the whole relationship era of Peter Parker and Mary Jane. And this is why this is such a big deal. I want to touch on this for a second. This is why the marriage, or I guess the relationship between Mary Jane Watson and Peter Parker was a huge deal, because despite the fact that writers came and went on the Spider-Man title, Peter Parker and Mary Jane were always a constant theme. And I don't know if it was editorial control. I don't have preview into that, you know, into that background information. But regardless of what the mandates were, if there were any at all, the consistent theme was that Peter Parker and Mary Jane Watson were building up to a marriage. It was always moving moving in an upward direction, and we always knew that was going to be the end result. Yes, they waxed and waned. Yes, they argued. Yes, they fought. But they always came back together, and we always knew they were going to get married. That's why fans were so mad when one more day happened, and Spider-Man's marriage to Mary Jane Watson was retconned, because it was literally decades of building up to that point, and it was wiped away over the course of a single graphic novel. That's what, one of the reasons why fans were so angry. Plus, they'd kind of grown up with this relationship. I mean, it was really just a core part of their lives. It was really their childhood in a lot of different ways. But the fact remains here that in the midst of of, uh, of the two of them, you know, being together, suddenly uh, Gray Hulk arrives, Joe Fixit Hulk arrives. Now, this is when we get into the caveat of his character, and that's one of the reasons why I waited until this point to basically do this. What Marvel did is they sat down and they said, okay, Savage Hulk, the Green Hulk, is effectively unbridled rage. This is just what happens when Bruce Banner gets angry, Savage Hulk emerges and just starts beating the hell out of everything. With Gray Hulk, they had to introduce something different. They couldn't say, well, whenever Bruce Banner gets angry, he becomes the Gray Hulk, because then fans would have said, well, what about the, the Green Hulk? and then Marvel would have been, you know, caught with their pants down. And so Marvel came back and they said, okay, here's what happens. In this particular storyline, Green Hulk is not part of the equation, or I guess in this point in Bruce Banner's life, the Green Hulk's not part of the equation because remember, this all tied into Peter David's run. And so Peter David was exploring all the different personalities of Bruce Banner, focusing on the multiple personality disorder that Bruce Banner effectively had, and that the Great Hulk was just one of these personas. And so they said, what happens is when the sun goes down, Joe Fixit comes out. When the sun comes up, Bruce Banner returns to normal. And it was actually a really cool Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde kind of scenario because that's what Peter David was focusing on. He was like, you know, the, the very essence of the Incredible Hulk and Bruce Banner dichotomy is a reflection of the dichotomy between Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, a rational human being versus his very sinister and dark other half. And so what happens is once, you know, Grey Hulk gets in here, he just starts tearing things up. And in fact, he basically says, look, I have no problems with Spider-Man, but the only reason why I'm doing this is because I've been paid to do that and money's the name of the game. That's just kind of how it goes. Now, the cool thing about this is that, again, because of the fact that the sun's coming up, because of the fact that Joe Fixit is not used to this environment, whereby the sun comes up, you know, three hours later on the East Coast than it does on the West Coast, uh, he ultimately ends up forced back into his banner form. And then Peter Parker begins hunting around for him. And so what he does is he basically takes refuge in uh, Roosevelt Park, I think it is, um, or Roosevelt Island, maybe. But he ends up taking up residence, whereby he basically, you know, goes back into his Hulk persona, and uh, he begins attacking Peter Parker. And so because of this, you know, as they're going through this massive conflict, which actually works out pretty cool and seeing Peter Parker dodge all these different attacks, it's pretty quick. But what Parker does is he punches the Incredible Hulk and sends him into space. Now, the Incredible Hulk's reaction to this is amazing. Like, Joe Fix's reaction is so awesome here because he was like, did I really just get knocked into orbit by Spider-Man? Like, did I really just get knocked into orbit by him? Because keep in mind, when it comes to Spider-Man's strength, and this is actually a really, really cool thing when it comes to his character, Spider-Man pulls his punches. He said this on a multitude of occasions. If Spider-Man were to like run up on Dr. Octopus and punch him as hard as he possibly could, he would kill him. He'd knock his head off his shoulders. And so he, <laughs> I want to see that comic. I just want to see Spider-Man run up on Dr. Octopus and just bam, and just like knock his head off his shoulders. <laughs> 
Oh, that would be, that's messed up. I have a very dark sense of humor. I worry myself sometimes. Anyway, he basically pulls his punches when he's fighting people, which is why he doesn't kill Mysterio when he fights him. It's why he doesn't kill Vulture. He could punch holes through them. And so, you know, this is really an instance where he's just kind of allowed to let loose only for a moment because with this extreme power that he possesses, if he were to punch the Incredible Hulk with the full might of the uni power, he would obliterate him. He would wipe him from the face of existence. And so, you know, while he's still kind of pulling his punches to a degree, sending the Hulk into orbit just astonishes Joe Fixit. And so because of this, once he returns back to Earth, he's like, nope, and he nopes right out of there. <laughs> he literally just leaves. He's just like, we're done. <laughs> I'm not going to fight a guy who's going to punch me into orbit. This is not, this is, nope, this is, this is not happening. And he basically just bails out. <laughs> That's pretty much what happens. He runs away. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty awesome to me. But if you guys are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit that subscribe button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like, and I will catch you all later. Peace. So I'd actually been waiting to release this video, and... I was waiting for the trailer to drop, but I didn't think the trailer for Spider-Man would actually drop this soon. I was kind of amazed. I was like, well, <laughs> I had heard tell that the trailer was supposed to drop with the release of Star Wars Rogue One. So I was, I figured I had like another week or so, you know, before I needed to make this video public, but I was like, well, we'll go ahead and just go with it and see what happens. So um, anyway, so Amazing Spider-Man uh, with all new, all different Marvel, I really kind of call this Amazing Spider-Man Volume 1 because it's kind of like this retelling, this rehashing of things. Uh, of course, it's continued by Dan Slott and it's actually pretty good. Um, Dan Slott's one of these weird writers where sometimes he writes really, really good stuff, and then sometimes he writes stuff that's not so good. Like, Silver Surfer was really good for, like, the first volume, but then it just kind of started dropping off, and I, I began to lose interest in it, you know, as Dan Slott's writing began to go on. But I really feel like Spider-Man is Dan Slott's bread and butter because he's done so much with it, you know, over the past few years that he's been writing it. But the issue is that Amazing Spider-Man with all new, all different Marvel comes out of Superior Spider-Man. And so what we're going to do is we're going to sort of go back and uh, and run over these things as we go through them because I'd done a video on Amazing Spider-Man when all new all different Marvel first dropped but I didn't actually go through the way I'm going through it now so we're going to make a lot more sense out of this kind of thing but uh, we initially pick up with an advertisement from Peter Parker this is one of the first major differences is that Peter Parker's now a billionaire he runs Parker Industries and the reason why this happened was during Superior Spider-Man Dr. Octopus had basically taken over the body of Peter Parker and because of that he had instigated a series of changes and a series of campaigns but he had also set in motion the formation of Parker Industries. The issue with this was that at the end of Superior Spider-Man, Parker Industries was this fledgling thing. It was a super small idea. At the start of all new, all different Marvel, it was suddenly a, a, a corporate empire. And so Dan Slott didn't really bridge the gap. He didn't tell us how we got from A to B. All he said was, well, well previously Parker Industries was a small little startup. Now it's a great big, huge conglomerate and it's on par with Parker, or I'm sorry, with uh, with Stark Industries, if not a little bit, little bit better than Stark Industries in terms of its technology stuff. Now, from here, we switch over to Peter Parker himself as Spider-Man alongside uh, Bobby Morris uh, Mockingbird. Now, again, you know, Morris is really a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent here, so she's kind of like this S.H.I.E.L.D. liaison working alongside Peter Parker. And again, Dan Slott really focuses a lot on the comedic element of, uh, of Peter Parker, and this is that he's like singing songs. <laughs> he's singing songs while he's riding along, and uh, they're trying to take out bad guys. But we also have him getting a message from Nick Fury. This is something else that I also wanted to address here, because I think that with Amazing Spider-Man, they're going to be a lot of people who really want to know about what's going on with him in the comics, but aren't really sure what's going on in comics in general because, you know, maybe they're just getting into it for the first time. Maybe they've been out of it for a while, but the fact remains that Nick Fury, as we see him here, and even the Nick Fury in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, is actually Nick Fury from the Ultimate Universe, which was designed to be a reimagining of the traditional Marvel Comics lineup with, you know, updated themes and, and you know, concepts for modern sensibilities. The issue here was that with Secret Wars, it was really designed to kind of get rid of the Ultimate Universe as it existed as a standalone entity and bring it into the main Marvel universe, which saw the original Nick Fury that we knew for, you know, however many years, 60 years or something like that, 40 years, basically wiped away and replaced with the ultimate Nick Fury, who of course, you know, really reflects Samuel L. Jackson. Uh, but the idea here is to incorporate that in, but at the very least to make, to make sense of this a little bit. But in terms of the overarching themes, this storyline actually focuses a lot on a group called Zodiac, uh, this organization that's, that's very clandestine, very hush-hush in terms of how they operate behind the scenes with Cloak and Dagger and that kind of thing, but I guess not Cloak and Dagger the heroes, but you guys know what I mean, in terms of operating, you know, very Cloak and Dagger-like, in terms of being very secret, but for the most part, it's also 
dance slot coming back and saying, hey, here's how a lot of these things work. Here's where we stand with the all new, all different Marvel Universe. I mean, wasn't the first one to do that. One of the first big people to do that was really Al Ewing with the Ultimates, where he said, here's where like the universe stands, Galactus, Molecule Man, the cosmic entities, so on and so forth. But with regards to Earth superheroes, um, you know, this is really just a, a, a pretty straightforward, you know, situation where Peter Parker and uh, Mockingbird are able to subdue one of these guys that's working for Zodiac. The problem is the guy goes to try to take a cyanide capsule, which would, you know, result in his own death. But Peter Parker steps in and basically neutralizes the toxin using an antidote that he had formulated. Now, the reason why he does this is because this is not the first time they've tried to capture somebody from the Zodiac. Instead, they've been trying to capture various people, but every time they got close enough to actually subdue one and take them into custody, they always took a capsule and it always ended up killing them, basically killed themselves. And so because of this, you know, Peter Parker was kind of forced to develop an antidote and then turn around and save, you know, this guy so that they can they can take him into custody and interrogate him. And so from here, we have him taking uh, Mockingbird, you know, to Parker Industries, where he is, uh, where he basically tells, you know, the other staff, hey, look, this is going to be Shields liaison for security, uh, you know, because we have a breach that we're trying to sort out. Now, in terms of who that breach is, we find that out quick, fast, and in a hurry. Dan Slott doesn't really waste any time saying, hey, here's the one that's causing the security problems. But the, the kicker about this, and this is what I love about Dan Slott's writing here, the kicker about this is that the Zodiac, Peter Parker being a billionaire, all that kind of stuff is not the main story. The main story happens at like the end of each issue because it's him building up to a much bigger thing, which we know right now to be uh, to be dead no more, you know, more or less a reimagining of the clone saga for the all new, all different Marvel universe. But again, you know, what we also learn is that Peter Parker has launched what he calls the Uncle Ben Foundation, because again, this is Peter Parker, you know, suddenly a billionaire now. I mean, he's got all this money, you know, with this corporation that doesn't seem to be running out of money anytime soon. But what's also interesting here is he takes an approach that's markedly different from Tony Stark. And Tony Stark, of course, originally used his wealth for weapons manufacturing. He turned it around and uh, began focusing on more of like energies and different things like that. But operating as a superhero and as Iron Man, it still saw Tony Stark being just very narcissistic and selfish. Peter Parker is not that way. Peter Parker has all this money, but instead of just being like, I am Peter Parker, you know, instead of being like, I am Spider-Man, instead, he, uh, he takes a very philanthropist approach and he started the Uncle Ben Foundation to basically provide help for people around the world who may not have it. Now, again, this is really just Dan Slott saying, here's the difference between these guys. But what Dan Slott also says is that because Peter Parker is basically the head of a company, the most logical question that would come up is, well, what happens if he has like some big meeting somewhere and it turns out there's a crisis that requires him to be there? Like, how does he reconcile those two things? Does he just say, well, I need to go answer a phone call and then, you know, take off into his Spider-Man costume? Instead, he doesn't. What he did is he brought on a guy named Hobie Brown. Now, this was Dan Slott reaching to be honest. <laughs> it's not bad, but it was funny to see him do this. Hobie Brown was a, you know, D-list character at best in the realm of Marvel Comics. His most significant role was being the first person to be arrested during the original Civil War event after the time period had passed, after the deadline had passed, for superheroes to register. That was his big claim to fame. He was more or less a martyr. Because of this, you know, he, he was prominent for a little bit, but it was never, it was never like people were going out to buy Prowler comics. It was never like there was anybody who was like, I I want to read a comic from Hobie Brown. <laughs> Instead, he was always a minor guy. But what Dan Slott does is he takes Hobie Brown out of the realm of obscurity and says he's going to be Spider-Man whenever Peter Parker cannot be Spider-Man. Now, I personally would have rather seen this as Miles Morales, but it works out, you know, nonetheless, with regards to the story being what it is. What we also do is we get a refreshment with regards to Horizon Labs. Now, Horizon Labs was an organization that Dan Slott, I believe it was Dan Slott, had created, and it introduced a guy named Max Modell. Now, what, what he did with this, is he, he kind of issued a record con to a degree, which is a retroactive continuity. That's where a writer comes in and changes history for the purpose of introducing something new. And so what he said was that growing up, Peter Parker had always idolized Max Modell. Now, the reason why this is a retcon is because Max Modell didn't exist until he was created and thrown into the Spider-Man comics. Up until that point, it was just Peter Parker like, hey, I'm just really, really smart. I'm going to make web shooters and I'm going to get into science and that kind of stuff. It was like he had a natural aptitude for it. What Dan Slott established was that Peter Parker had grown up idolizing Max Modell. And Max Modell was the reason for why he wanted to get involved into uh, into science in the first place. And so Max Modell always played a very significant role in the life of Peter Parker after his introduction. So what Peter also did is he created something called Horizon University. And Horizon University is going to be uh, very similar to Horizon Labs in the sense that Horizon Labs was like the Spider-Man equivalent of the Future Foundation, right? You know, Future Foundation was made by Reed Richards to basically educate the younger generation to bring together the smartest kids of the world to solve the problem of everything, basically, which I'm really hoping we see that Peter Parker gets an invitation to Future Foundation, it would mean that Marvel has the rights to the Fantastic Four. But <laughs> with regards to Horizon Labs, this was the Spider-Man equivalent. It was just like
like the smartest people working on whatever projects they wanted to work on. But the rule was they have to be projects that just benefit humanity that progress science and technology in a forward direction. And so, you know, because of the fact that Max Modell had such a huge impact on Peter Parker, he basically christened, you know, Horizon University to be a continuation of the work that Max Modell had started and the fact that he had been an influence on Peter Parker. And so from here, you know, he also begins to have a conversation with a woman named uh, named Sajani Joffrey. And we'll actually get back to her here in a second. But in the midst of this whole thing, he's suddenly set upon by these, these agents of Zodiac. Now, the funny thing about this is that, again, because Hobie Brown is basically Spider-Man, or at least operating as Spider-Man, because all eyes are on Peter Parker, he couldn't simply just vanish. You know, he's no Superman here. The result is that Hobie Brown leaps into action. We, we basically learn that Zodiac seems to be here for the purpose of harnessing this technology that Peter Parker has developed, you know, with regards to, uh, to you know, communications and so on and so forth, you know, ushering a new era of communication devices. And because of this, you know, Peter says, okay, fine, here, you can have this device, throws it to the Zodiac, and they basically just take off. And so we ultimately learned that, you know, when he speaks to Hobie Brown, that Zodiac has about 12 hours before they'll successfully be able to crack the encrypted device, uh, after which all the information stored about Parker Industries will be released out to Zodiac, which they can do whatever they want with. But we also learned that this information leak from within Parker Industries was actually happening from Sajani Joffrey. And so, you know, Parker basically cuts her some slack, says, hey, look, I've got some big fish to fry. I can't really worry about this too much. If you do it again, I'm going to fire you and then I'll, I'll have you tossed in jail for corporate espionage or something like that. And so she says, okay, fine, calls it a day. Now, from here, we pick up with these little tail ends of Superior Spider-Man in the sense that we basically pick up with Anna Marconi and uh, Dr. Octopus. Now, Anna Marconi was a girl that had appeared as part of Superior Spider-Man and it was actually a situation where Dr. Octopus had fallen in love with Anna Marconi because of the fact that he loved her mind, lo loved what it is that she stood for in terms of how great she was as a person. And this went great. This went really, really well with Doc Ock because as Superior Spider-Man, he was literally just trying to become a good guy. He was trying to do good things. And it was a beautiful run. It was probably it's probably one of the best runs of Spider-Man in the last 10 years, maybe. I mean, in the last decade, it's 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 a beautifully written story. I think you'd be hard pressed to find anybody who said Superior Spider-Man was bad. Some people didn't like it, but overall it was pretty good storytelling. But we also learned that Dr. Octopus is basically confined his mind inside of a robot. And so what this does is this allows us to continue on and wrap back around into these events involving Zodiac, but also the Fantastic Four. Now, what we also have here is, you know, Peter Parker and Hobie Brown working together to basically trace out where Zodiac had gone to, because of course there was a tracking device of sorts within this particular item. But once they get inside and they begin to interrogate, they begin to, you know, fight off these various Zodiac forces, we ultimately find out that one of the members of Zodiac had basically initiated a self-destruct inside the vessel, inside this, uh, their base of operations, and they had taken the information, or I guess taken the encrypted device, and basically sent out the encrypted information to every Zodiac base on the planet, in the sense that in hours or so, uh, Zodiac would at some point or another essentially crack it. And in doing so, they would be able to release or find the information about Parker Industries and send it out to the world. But ultimately we learned that this was actually part of the plan of Peter Parker, that, you know, once he had made this decision to throw it out, you know, throw this device to Zodiac, that he alongside Nick Fury and S.H.I.E.L.D. had used the signal as it was being sent out to the Zodiac bases to locate those Zodiac bases, root Zodiac out, and then take it out in its entirety. So it was actually a pretty, pretty ingenious maneuver, albeit something that was planned uh, plan sporadically without any real forethought because they were kind of forced into it. But picking up with this background, picking up with leading into the bigger things, we actually end up joining Rhino as he's out in, you know, the off the coast of Guatemala. <laughs> <laughs> and he's initially met by a guy, and we don't know who he is. He's just, you know, he's very enigmatic, you know, very cloak and dagger here. This guy basically says, hey, look, you know, I need you to come work for me. And, you know, of course, Rhino says, absolutely not. You cannot offer me anything to come and work for you. But what he does is he actually presents Rhino with Oksana. And the result of this is that Rhino immediately, like, turns tail. And Rhino says, okay, because Oksana was dead. Like, you know, she's she was presumed to have been gone. But the fact that she's here now means that this guy, for whatever reason, is able to either resurrect the dead or bring them back. Now, of course, we know that these are people who are just being cloned, but at the moment right now, it's a, a chance for this person to basically bring in Rhino, one of the strongest people in, or at least a, a pretty formidable person in Marvel's comics, and have him work on his behalf. Again, we don't really know what direction these things are going to go in, but what we also do is we pick up with Peter Parker, where he basically reveals that he's taken over the Baxter building and made it the New York branch of Parker Industries. Now, what this does is this earns the ire of Johnny Storm. Now, this was a huge deal when this happened. Again, we also have Zodiac kind of dealing in the background, but I want to focus less on them, and I want to focus on the Fantastic Four. In the time leading up until Secret Wars, it was no secret that the Fantastic Four were basically being 
eliminated by Marvel Comics. And, you know, if the rumors are to be believed, you know, it was a circumstance whereby Marvel was just not going to get the rights back to the Fantastic Four in film form. So they said, okay, fine, then we'll just eliminate them. We'll get rid of them. Now, we know that Fantastic Four didn't die in the traditional sense. Instead, Susan Storm and Reed Richards basically stayed behind alongside their son, Franklin Richards, and Molecule Man for a time, recreating the multiverse, literally creating universes and sending them out into the multiverse. The problem with this was that we also have Ben Grimm and we have Johnny Storm here, but as far as they're concerned, they don't know when Reed and Sue are coming back. And so the Fantastic Four is more or less defunct. They're an organization that doesn't exist anymore, but neither does the Future Foundation. And so everything symbolic of the Fantastic Four is effectively gone from Marvel Comics. Now, with regards to Johnny Storm showing up here, because he's so mad, he almost feels like Peter Parker is basically dishonored the legacy of the Fantastic Four by taking over the Baxter building. But what Peter Parker does is he sits down and he says, this is not the case. You know, instead, what I've basically done here is I've turned it into a tribute. But he takes him through and he shows him the new Spidey mobile. And, and what's actually kind of funny here is when he says, hey, here's a Spidey mobile that I built, uh, Johnny Storm loses it. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny Storm freaks out. And the reason why is because the Spidey Mobile, the original Spidey Mobile, was designed by Johnny Storm, you know, at the Baxter building for Spider Man to use. It was kind of like their link. It was kind of like, you know, hey, this is our little thing. This is our little branch of friendship. You know, this is just a, a thing between us. But then Peter Parker went and designed another one. And so Johnny Storm's like, dude, are you serious? And loses his mind and uh, fre <laughs> freaks out on Peter Parker. And it's just funny to me that Johnny Storm just loses, loses his mind over a, a, a redesigned Spider Mobile. But ultimately, you know, everything seems to come clean when Spider-Man ends up taking uh, Johnny Storm down to the lobby and says, hey, look, I commissioned Alicia Masters to create this carving of the Fantastic Four. You know, Valeria Richards, Franklin Richards, Susan, Reed, Ben Grimm, you. You know, this building is basically me just keeping it safe. And Peter says, the reason why I did this is because if he hadn't done it, it's one of the most popular buildings in all of New York. Somebody would have taken it. Somebody would have taken it over. And so he says, me doing this is a way to remember the Fantastic Four because I was so close to them, but to also make sure that some guy just won't be a dick and just like buy the building, you know, and just like turn it into loft apartments or something like that, you know? And so again, this is really just a, a chance for Peter to kind of pay homage to the, the really like the first family of the superhero community. And so from here, it's really just kind of this circumstance where we're picking up with uh, S.H.I.E.L.D. more or less rooting out all these different members of Zodiac. But we also find out that Aunt May and J. Jonah Jameson Sr. are working as part of the Parker Foundation. Foundation. There we go. I'm sorry, the Uncle Ben Foundation. I cannot talk. My mind is literally everywhere. Now, with regards to Aunt May and J. Jonah Jameson Sr., this was actually a relatively new development. It wasn't too long ago. But one of the biggest issues with Aunt May is that she was literally just this old lady that sat at home. This little old lady who sat at home, presumably watched Wheel of Fortune in Jeopardy, and she really had no real significant role in Peter Parker's life, aside from being the, the, the person that kind of kept him grounded. But as Peter Parker, you know, developed other relationships, Mary Jane Watson, despite the fact that that was retconned, as he, you know, got into all these different things. He had superheroes to fall back on, you know, to keep him grounded, to kind of, you know, keep his level head. Aunt May became someone that Marvel never really knew what to do with. And so what happened is they came around and they said, well, let's just have her get married again. And so she actually married the father of J. Jonah Jameson, the guy that hates Peter Parker. <laughs> <laughs> which is actually a really funny choice. It was a really good decision to make. But what this did is it allowed Marvel to breathe new life into Aunt May. It allowed Marvel to basically reinvigorate her character and to have her look at life in a way that she had never really looked at since the passing of Uncle Ben. Something else to keep in mind, and I think this is also something very, you know, very important, something worth mentioning, is that Marvel was very clear to say J. Jonah Jameson Sr. is not going to be a replacement for Uncle Ben. And this was actually really important because, you know, for a lot of fans who had grown up reading Spider-Man, Man comics. I wouldn't say they saw themselves as Spider-Man. They didn't see Aunt May as their aunt, but they did grow an attachment to the relationship between all the characters that were part of the Spider-Man mythos. And either it was Uncle Ben coming back or it was no one taking his place. You know, Spider-Man fans are very, very controlling when it comes to the Spider-Man mythos. They really don't like to see things edited too far out from what they're used to. And so because of this, you know, Marvel was like, hey, look, yes, she's with J. Jonah Jameson Sr., but he's not going to go to Peter Parker and be like, I'm your new Uncle Ben and you should listen to me. That's not going to happen at all. You know, it was simply a scenario where it was a chance to really bring about Aunt May, fold her out a little bit more. But we also have these uh, these warrior goblin, green goblins that are attacking, you know, where it is that Aunt May and uh, and J. John Jameson Sr. are at. And the result is that Peter Parker actually abandons his mission alongside S.H.I.E.L.D. to root out and defeat Zodiac and instead literally takes off, you know, to go find, um, to go find Aunt May. Now, the war goblins are 
easily dealt with by Peter Parker. I mean, you know, these, these are foes that they're easily able to cope with, but what Dan Slott's doing here is he's saying, here's the bigger picture. Here's everything as it stands right now. It's literally someone out there or groups of people out there who are just throwing everything they have at defeating Peter Parker every step of the way. Now, of course, because of the fact that Peter Parker is able to deal with these war goblins pretty quickly, you know, because he's able to, to make sure that people are saved, because of the fact that he has Mockingbird, who was forced to abandon her mission alongside Peter Parker because the two of them were both sharing the same jet. Once everything's clear and once everybody's saved, Mockingbird reads him the riot act. <laughs> She almost, she damn near throws the book at him. And it's hilarious, you know, because she's like, you literally forced me to leave my mission. And she's like, I never abandoned a mission because for her, it's, it's an extremely important part of who she is. And this is really kind of cool because, you know, Bobby Morris is a character that focuses largely on what her role is, what her assignment is. And she will see that assignment to its conclusion, even if it costs her life in the process. She's that dedicated of an agent when it comes to, uh, when it comes to S.H.I.E.L.D. And so because of this, you know, we also, again, pick up with, uh, with Doc Connors, with the lizard. And again, this is the same mysterious guy who shows up and says, hey, I'd love you to come, you know, to, to come and work for me. And Doc Connor says, absolutely not. I will, I'm not going to work for anybody. But then suddenly he shows, you know, Doc Connor's wife and son who are dead. And Doc Connor's turncoats and says, absolutely, I will do whatever it is that you want me to do so long as I do not lose these loved ones again. And so again, you know, from here, we basically transition over to uh, to the tail end of the story. And this has been going on for a little while here. <laughs> but we essentially have Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. We, of course, have Nick Fury. We have Agent Coulson, Peter Parker, you know, really just a combination of the security team from Parker Industries alongside S.H.I.E.L.D.'s capable members. And the idea is to continue to try to root out Zodiac. And ultimately, they're successful. I mean, there's really not a lot to offer here in terms terms of any real discussion, any real debate. Um, in fact, it's really not that huge of a story. It's just something kind of ongoing in the background. But Peter Parker also comes to the realization that somebody is continuing to feed information to Zodiac behind the scenes. And so ultimately he says, this had to have been Sajani Joffrey. You know, he says, look, she turned against me before. She she seeded information to the enemy before. It has to be her. Now, the implication here is that it's actually Dr. Octopus who's been doing this without Peter Parker knowing. Because remember, no one knows that Dr. Octopus is inside this robot. No one's aware of that. Instead, as far as they're concerned, it's just a robot that's there that tends to their needs and, and does whatever it is they need to have done with regards to Parker Industries. And so as this little bit begins to come to an end, we actually find out that the last missing member of Zodiac, um, this guy was actually part of Parker Industries, who was an investor. And the result is he's, he's still part of Parker Industries. He's still investing. Peter Parker has no idea what's going on. And it seems as though this person could continue the campaign of essentially, you know, causing problems for, for Peter Parker behind the scenes. But again, this whole thing with Zodiac, um, um, the storyline, that, that storyline was decent enough, but to me, it was never a front part of the, the comic. It was really just Dan Slott saying, here's something going on, you know, to kind of fill pages while I have this other event taking place. Because again, this is all leading up to the clone conspiracy and all that kind of good stuff. But if you guys are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the subscribe button to become part of the Rob Core. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and leave a comment down below. Let me know what you guys think and let me know how hyped you are about that Spider-Man trailer because I'm, I'm very, I'm very excited. <laughs> and I'll I will catch you all later. Peace.